Is this what we have to look forward to for the next year? I hope not. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for my weekly vlog on Monday, August 17th, 2020. Vlog number 181, or the 159th day of COVID problems. So let's get right in without further ado. And what have I been working on? Well, behind me, you have seen this in bits and pieces. It is now, the top is now complete on, of this Christmas quilt. Uh, and it is a Christmas tree. And I know you can't see the whole thing. I'll try to hold part of it up. Oops, that's not working very well, is it? But anyways, it's a tree trunk. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's all done. I'm kind of pleased with it. Um, I'm not particularly overly excited by my color choice, but this was what they call a uh, jelly roll strip type of quilt. And I just picked two jelly rolls. They were both the same jelly rolls. Jelly rolls are two and a half inch strips by width of fabric and uh, put it together like that. So it's meant to be a little bit on the scrappy side. Uh, the colors, I usually work in brighter colors. These are a little bit more sedate. But nevertheless, I think it turned out pretty good. And so now I have to get it layered and quilted and we'll go from there. And as far as quilting is concerned, I know that people who do a lot of free motion quilting would be just titillated with all this white space to fill that in with uh, quilting. Um, I will fill it in. I don't know what I'm going to do. I am thinking that I might do stitch in the ditch to outline the tree and the corner treatments up here. And then I might just do straight line walking foot quilting as opposed to my normal um, wavy line, or I might just do the wavy line. I'm not sure. Um, I might even get out my rulers and try some ruler foot quilting, but not sure. It's all up in the air right now. It's going to depend on my mood and what I think I can do with it. Um, I should be more experimental um, because really you can't ruin it when you do any kind of quilting on it. If you pick a very subtle color, and that's the other thing, what color am I going to pick? I might pick just an off-white for the whole thing because the colors are muted and I really don't want my quilting to show up uh, and take away from the tree. Now I had somebody suggest to me, I think it was Kim on Chatterbox Quilts, that I should do some dense quilting around the tree so the tree itself will pop. And I could do that. And I might. Um, like I said, I'm still up in the air as to how I'm going to tackle this, but I think it turned out pretty nice and yeah, it's a Christmas quilt. I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I might give it away as a gift. Um, I don't know. I don't know yet what I'm going to do with it, but I made it. So there it is. And what else have I been up to? Well, I've been carrying on with my uh, Halloween wall hanging and you've seen pieces of that. I got another couple of tiles done and I did do an idiot quilter showing how I do these tiles. Um, these take two hours to do. The video is not two hours long. Try and get my microphone cord out of my way here. Um, I only did it in bits and pieces throughout the process because a lot of it is repetitious and um, and I tried to speed it up too in certain parts. That was something I discovered. I, I edit my videos very seldom as you know and when I do edit them, I use my iPad for that, using iMovie. Well, apparently, the version of iMovie that's on my iPad will only allow me to double the speed of a segment. Um, I really was hoping I could do it like four times uh, faster than that, but I couldn't. So if I do something like that again in the future, I may have to use a different editing software on my main computer. And now that I have the new computer, um, I should be able to do something a little bit more sophisticated in the editing than I usually do. But I like iPad. I like iMovie. It's very simple to use. And as a person who does very little editing of his videos, <laughs> as you know, um, simple is good. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, back to these. These are the two latest tiles that I have done. And I'm really loving this, this whole thing. It's called Haunted Village by Anita Good Designs. And um, it's gonna look really quite nice. 
uh, when it's done. But I now have 10 of the 16 tiles done, so six more to go. So with six times two is 12 hours minimum, plus sashing, uh, plus yeah, there's a lot of hours left on this one. But when it's done, it's gonna look great, I think. So anyways, and then I was experimenting with, I have another embroidery program I bought about a year, year and a half ago, uh, that allows you to create a Christmas quilt in the hoop uh, using your embroidery machine and it's applique. And when I looked at it a year ago and I tried a couple of them, I didn't really like the look. Well, I went back and revisited it. Now, one of the things I didn't like about it was at that time, I wasn't very confident in doing in the hoop applique. And since then, I've had more experience. Um, so I thought I'd give it another go. Now, I'm not, I don't like every one of their applique uh, motif, mo motifs, I guess, whatever they are. Um, but I found for like four that I kind of like and I thought I could do something with them. So I have done four of them. One's a Christmas tree. And then there's a piece of holly with the berries. A couple of snowflakes and some stars. And I am thinking, at first I was thinking, well, these were, would be what I would use to make a small uh, lap or throw quilt. But I'm thinking now, not a quilt. I'm thinking more a table runner. I'm thinking that maybe what I could do is take these four designs and I would add maybe make it into a, a larger block, maybe some like a star block around the edges uh, using flying geese, then add a, a skinny border and a little wider border to the end of it. Um, I might even try my hand at creating points. I haven't done that before, but it doesn't look that difficult. And making it into like a Christmas table runner instead. Um, and when I make all these Christmas things, last year I made a whole bunch of Christmas things too for the house. This year I'm thinking maybe some of these things, if I get enough of them done in a head, they could be uh, nice little quick Christmas gifts for like the neighbors, um, family, things like that. Um, you know, just little quickie hostess-like gifts. Not that we'll probably all be going to a lot of Christmas parties this year, um, given the situation. However, maybe if we all think positive, maybe we will be. But anyways, that's what I'm doing right now, as well as all kinds of other projects. Never bored. Never bored. Okay, so that takes us to uh, not one, but two YouTube channels of the week. Now, both of these are similar in content, and they're both about um, knitting and quilting. Uh, mostly knitting, though, I think, on these ones. More the wool arts, if you will. Um, but the thing that also keeps them connected to each other, makes them connected to each other, is that they're all done by guys. And they all happen to be gay guys. And I don't watch these very regularly because they're primarily about knitting. And I'm not into knitting. I tried knitting years ago and it was a complete fail for me. No good at that whatsoever. Walter used to knit. He used to knit very well. He used to make Icelandic sweaters. Um, that was many years ago, like 25, 30 years ago he did that, and they were beautiful, and he hasn't done it since. He moved on in his interests too, of course. But there are many, many people out there that are interested in knitting, and there are a lot of knitting YouTube channels. Um, I think there's more about knitting and crocheting than there is about quilting. So if you're a knitter or a crocheter, you might find these of interest. This week's YouTube of the week is actually two YouTube channels. Both of these YouTube channels deal with knitting. One is called Needles at the Ready and the other is Sweet Tea No Shade. Both of these are done by men and they just happen to be gay and they are all about knitting. Now what's great about these is if you're a beginner knitter or even if you're an advanced knitter you'll get a lot of tips and tricks but you'll also see projects and things that have been giving them trouble, some of their failures and a lot of their successes. Plus both YouTube channels are filled with some humor and general chit chat. So if you like Stephen and Walter live you're going to like Needles at the Ready, and Sweet Tea, 
no shade. So, so those two YouTube channels are listed in the show notes below. And uh, also in the show notes below, we have the latest version, as we always do, of Stephen and Walter Live. And this week, we actually got off topic. Well, that's not unusual with us. Um, and for some reason, we got a lot of questions about embroidery machines. And we had quite a discussion about different machines and things like that. So if you happen to be in the market for a sewing machine or embroidery machine, and you didn't see Stephen and Walter Live this week, you may want to check out the replay on that. Our main theme was something I'm going to extend on today, and that was about ageism. Um, uh, basically, we talked about, have you ever been discriminated because of your age? Meaning, you know, especially when you're 60 plus years old, suddenly society thinks you should be dead. Anyways, we had a, a good discussion about that. It wasn't that long a discussion because we spent more time talking about embroidery machines. But, you know, with Stephen and Walter Live, it's what, it is what it is. If, you know, people want to talk about something that we didn't think about talking about, then that's okay. We don't mind that at all because that's just the way we roll with Stephen and Walter Live. Um, so, anyways, check that out if you weren't there yesterday. And uh, I have the... Uh, connection or the YouTube link to the book of the week which we'll come to in a few moments and of course there is my idiot quilter episode number 77 which basically shows how I do those Halloween tiles and that was a request uh, a regular subscriber sent me a note asking if I would do that that and your wish is my command and so I did and so that takes me to what's pissing me off this week and I want to talk about the elderly okay in our society and but what I want to talk about is putting elderly in harm's way now what has done this for me is that the nursing home my mother's in just notified us that all visitations have been cancelled they had an outbreak they had one person get COVID a 90 year old who was quickly isolated from all the other residents now the nursing home is testing everybody, staff and the residents, keeping everybody out and trying to determine where this came from. Well, I can tell you where it came from, okay? What I suspect, I don't know this for sure. To do a visitation at my mother's nursing home, you have to book it online. You get 30 minutes. You've heard me talk about this before. You have to be masked up. You have to stay six feet away from the person. Um, you have 30 minutes, you cannot pass anything to them, you cannot touch them, hug them, kiss them, nothing. Uh, it's for their safety, it's for your safety, it's for everybody's safety. And they're very, very strict about this at the nursing home. Okay. Only people allowed to actually physically go inside the nursing home are the people who are staff. And then they have a group that are called essential workers. I don't know how many of these people there are in that group, but they had to show evidence that they had had a COVID negative test uh, within a two week period before they were allowed in. Now these they call essential workers. I think they're people who go in and help feed those residents who can't feed themselves to help out the staff. And I think some of them have people, family members, who are in that situation in the home and they go in and help out with them. Uh, but they're very strict about who gets in. And it's, like I said, the staff who are tested on a regular basis and it is these essential workers. Now, as of yesterday, they retested everybody on Friday. They tested all the staff, they tested all of the residents. They had 86% of the results had come back by yesterday for the residents and those 86% of the residents that the test came back for were all negative. And as for the staff, 85% of the test results have come back with them. So 85% of the staff that had been tested are also negative. In other words, so far, so good. Everybody is negative. The rest of the results are supposed to come back today. And this nursing home is very good at keeping everything transparent and keeping all of us up to date on what's going on. They're also double uh, retesting the resident that was showing signs of COVID to make sure it was uh, a correct 
test that it wasn't a negative positive or false positive okay this home to date has had only one other person with covid and that was a false positive and it's all because and you've heard me say this many times before this place has been extremely proactive and extremely rigid and it's in keeping everybody safe and i know they've had some flack from family members of of people that are in there who don't like this who think it is their god given right to go in when they want to go in with a minimal amount of protection and to touch and to hold and to kiss and to hug their loved ones okay i don't have that feeling about that kind of thing but that's because i'm not a tactile person i am not a touchy feely huggy kissy person in fact on the rare occasions that somebody who doesn't really know me that well who tries to give me a hello or goodbye hug they hit a cement wall yeah i just like that i don't like being touched never have i do not come from a demonstrative family we are not a kissy huggy bunch at all so you know to me i don't get that and therefore i'm not upset that i cannot hug my mother okay um but even if i wanted to be a hugger I know I cannot do that right now. I mean, we're told this. This is not news. You'd have to be more than living under a rock not to understand that. But there are some people who feel that this is an invasion of their privacy, that it's an invasion of their personal rights and the whole bit, and they have to go in and they got to hug mommy or daddy uh, with this. So I suspect that what has happened, again, I have absolutely no proof for this, but I'll have a better proof of it once I hear today or tomorrow about the tests. And if all of those tests come back negative, all of them, then you know exactly what has happened. At least I think I do. Somebody didn't pay attention to the rules. Somebody came in visited mom, visited dad, visited granny, grandpa, whatever, and decided they were going to touch them or they got too close into them or they didn't wear their mask. Now, I find this really hard to uh, to fathom because th the visits are basically supervised from what I know. There is a, a staff member there in the visiting area keeping an eye on things. So, you know, reminding you, ah, 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 can't touch, don't touch look with your eyes from six feet away that kind of thing but I know from what the administrator of the building has sent out that there have been people who don't want to follow those rules what a hard job she has and I sent her a note to let her know how much I appreciated her uh, keeping you know tabs on all this stuff and, and being very rigid with it because yeah it's a matter of life or death so I think people who do this kind of thing, who insist that they have to touch a loved one, are selfish. Are selfish. Why do they need to touch? Yes, I know there are people in the world, many people in the world, that are tactile. But given the situation, we know that this is not the time to be tactile at all. But for some reason, something inside them says they have to do this. Now, I suspect, in some cases, it's guilt. Yes, guilt. You know... Uh, your loved one's in a nursing home. You don't see them as often as you'd like to. Suddenly this crisis comes up. There's a possibility they could get COVID and die. And I think it's guilt. Oh, well, I've got to make up for this. And, you know, I I've got to show this person. I've got to demonstrate to them how much I really care about them. So I will hug them. I will give them a little peck on the cheek. I will do this. Maybe. Or it's just people being selfish enough to say, you can't, you're not the boss of me. You can't tell me what to do and what not to do. I'm paying for this, or this is paid for by my grandmother or my mother or whatever. Um, I can do whatever I want to do. No, you can't. Get over it. That's the problem in the United States. That's why the disease is spread, spreading in the United States so badly, because people don't pay attention to the rules. They think they have these God-given rights. I get riled up about this. Can you tell? You have these God-given rights. To do whatever the damn thing they want to do. Well, they don't. 
They don't when it puts other people in harm's way. And the elderly right now in our society are in harm's way. These people are often not in the best of health. Their immune systems are compromised. Uh, they are in a weakened state already. What are you thinking? Would you go and hug an elderly loved one if you had chicken pox or if you had measles or if you had a bad case of the flu? Would you? I don't think you would. And if you would, you're a murderer. Simple as that. You're a murderer. And you're just not affecting that loved one when you do this. You're affecting everyone. Did this directly affect me? Yes, it did. And I was going to talk about this later, but I'll talk about it now because it's part of all of this. My sister and I had arranged to visit my mother for the first time in five months on Friday. It was her 80th birthday. We had everything covered. We had everything. We were following the rules to the st strictest, what do you call it? To the to the T, like the whole bit. We, we had it all down. And then two days before we're scheduled to go, we get this call. Somebody. It didn't just float in there. It was transmitted by somebody. And that somebody didn't follow the rules. Now, you may say, well, maybe they were asymptomatic and they didn't know they had it. Well, that's quite a possibility. But the same thing is they could have avoided giving it or transmitting to somebody if they had followed the rules. Pretty much. Is it foolproof? No. But if you've got a mask on, if the person you're visiting has a mask on, if you're at least six feet apart, if you aren't showing any signs of having anything to do with your health, then the chances are, if you're following all these rules, you're sanitizing your hands, doing that whole bit, that you are not transmitting the disease if you are asymptomatic. So, symptomatic, asymptomatic, that's the term I want. Asystematic is something else. So, you know, and so there, I had to call my mother and had to say, okay, mom, I guess you know that you're back in lockdown again. And she did. And I said, I'm sorry. And I was. It made me feel really bad. It's my mother's 80th birthday. It's a milestone. And last year, we had something planned for her birthday, and that all went awry um, because of certain circumstances and the whole bit. So kind of thinking, although we couldn't do something on a grander scale like we were planning last year, uh, because of COVID, we were still going to be able to see her. And because of somebody who came in and transmitted disease, that affected me. And it's affecting everybody else. In the nursing home, they just started opening up their in-house activities. They've been not doing those for the last five months to keep the residents separated. They just were in a position where they thought they could do that. Again, there were restrictions, but it was something else for the residents to look forward to. Cancelled. Because of the actions of one selfish individual. Now, I am curious to find out what the nursing home will be reporting as far as the tests are concerned. I know it can't be done probably, but I would hope that the nursing home can figure out where this came from. And if it is indeed come from an outside individual, or even if it's a staff member for that matter, I hope they can narrow it right down to the individual and then take them out and have them shot. Okay, maybe that's extreme. But maybe it's not so extreme because this resident that now has it 90 years old, now this person is doing well, according to the nursing home, which is good, but you know, it could be the exact opposite too, that could kill them. So think, think people. I've heard a lot of people whining about the fact that they haven't been able to socialize. They haven't been able to get out and see their friends or get their out to see their loved ones and things like that. That's why we have technology, use it, use it. 
we will get a handle on this. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's going to take some time. Let's get, let's suck it up, buttercups, and get on with our lives. But this is something that we've never had to go through in our generation. And so let's do it right, okay? Let's not make things worse. So, you know, think twice. You're going out in public, wear your mask, wash your hands, stay six feet apart, do all the things the health authorities are saying, are telling us to do. It's not your right to kill someone else. And you've heard me say that before. Okay, let's move on. This really makes me ugly when I think about this. It really does. Okay. Let's look at fabric, shall we? I'm going to have some coffee. So, ordered some more fabric online from a quilt store that's not that far away from us. Uh, it's up north of us. Um, I've ordered from them before. And uh, I was checking out their Christmas fabrics and things, and man, they didn't have much to choose from, from that, but I bought a few things. So one of the things they had on sale was this batik. Now, I was going through my stash of fabrics, and you know, I love blues and purples. So I have lots of blues and purples. But one color that I seem to be a little bit shy on are yellows and oranges. And yellows, of course, go with blue. Um and that kind of thing. So I got some of this. This was on sale. It's a batik. I think I bought two meters of it. Um, what else did I buy? This one I just thought was pretty. Again, it's in blues and purples and that kind of thing, but I really liked it. And oh, I didn't buy this actually. Sorry. Walter gave this to me. He went through his stash and I had bought Right, get on the pot here, Stephen. Okay. I bought this. This is a panel. Um, I actually haven't opened it up. Shall we open it up? Take a look at it? You know how I love butterflies as far as a printer. You know, in real life, do butterflies throw me? Mm, not really. They kind of scare me <laughs> a little bit when they land on you. I've been to a butterfly conservatory before, and actually, that's really interesting, but they will land on you. And you know, have you ever seen a butterfly up close? Their wings are beautiful, but their little bodies are ugly as sin. Um, and I do know a person who has a phobia about butterflies in any form. Um, she's in my art journal group. And if you show her a butterfly that's even a, just a paper butterfly or something like that, she'll hit the roof. So I kind of get that in a way. I'm not near that bad, but I love them on fabric and in other things. And so here's the panel part of it and I thought like, it's got my colors in it and very pretty um, I don't work with panels much but I will definitely not be cutting that one up I will use it as a centerpiece of something and in the meantime Walter went through his stash and look what he found in his stash and he says he's not going to use it so he gave it to me so I have this that'll go very well with this it's the same line Okay, a fabric. So that's nice. And then he also had this one. And he had this one. Now I have a whole bunch of fat quarters that cost me about 80 bucks that I bought mm, probably a year ago uh, from my local store ultimate sewing and it's all butterfly prints uh and it's beautiful so in the future i am going to do a quilt that is going to be butterfly themed won't be my first one because i did my show quilt that i made uh, a year and a half ago for our quilt show from the guild um the fabric that was in that was a butterfly fabric too and so i kind of did a theme around that uh so it wouldn't be my first one I have no idea what the design will be. I have no idea when I'll get to it. But I've got these fabrics now and I love them. I just absolutely love them. And he also found his stash, this one, which could go with, you know, some of these to a point. Maybe a little busy, but it's my colors, so. Now, with the other place up north that I ordered from, I also got this. This is yellow, but very different. 
Um, I bought it because it, it kind of has an Art Deco look to it. And I love Art Deco. I actually have a pattern for doing an Art Deco design. So that might work in something like that. I also bought some, you know, you can never have too much red for accent colors. And this is just a, a marbleized, mottled uh, batik. And I've had ones like this before too, but I'm low, so I stocked up. This is another batik, again with the yellows and the golds and the oranges in it, which I thought is kind of nice. It would definitely go with something like that. It would definitely go with that. When I buy fabric, I usually buy fabric that I think will go with all kinds of other fabrics. Um, now, this one I bought, and I'm sorry, and I'm going to say something right now that some people may take offense to, but this one is just old lady fabric. <laughs> I don't know why. I think of, you know, an old lady from the 1950s house dress or something. But I like the colors in it, and it's very busy, but it's a small print, and when it gets cut up to be used as part of a quilt, I think it would go in very nicely. Then I went to Ultimate Sewing on the weekend because there were a couple of fabrics, you know, when I'm doing these things here that I was talking about, this red and this white, I was getting kind of low on, so I thought, hmm, if I actually do turn that into something larger than a table runner, I may need more. So I bought a couple of meters of the white. This is Christmas fabric. Although the design on it is not specifically Christmas, it's got that feel, but you could use it for other things. And I bought the equivalent in the red and gold as well. Same pattern, just in red and gold. And then while I was in the store, of course, I had to see what other Christmas fabrics they have. They don't have that great a selection yet. Uh, it's becoming a little late now for Christmas fabrics. Believe it or not, it's August, yes, but this stuff comes in on the summer because people want to get started on their Christmas projects. Uh, but I did see this in the reds with the gold stars. I like that. And they also had it in blue. And, you know, I bought, I showed it to you a few weeks ago, the uh, blue Christmas fabric that looked better online than it did when I got it. Um, that's why I sort of bought this because I might be able to use it along with this and other things and maybe it won't look so ugly to me anymore. So that's uh, quite a big stack of fabric I've just acquired and uh, where I'm going to put it I don't know I'm out of space. Yeah I'm a hoarder sorry that's, I just had I guess that's what I am I'm a fabric hoarder. I said hoarder. Okay. Book review. Book and Arts. Handcrafting Artist Books by Dorothy Simpson Krauss. In my stash. Nice looking book, really. Inside. Nice pictures of very artistic books. Now, this is the kind of book that you use for inspiration. Because these are books made by people who are book artists. Um, it's not a really tell you how to do it. It does give some information about construction. But more or less, it's uh, a book. Well, this one tells you, you know, how to do certain bindings. And two, it's a thermal binding. So there are instructions in here as well. And it shows you how to do different types of binding stitches and things like that. Um, but really inspirational, gives you some really great ideas for making journals or books that basically are one of a kind. So if you're into journal making and you want to up your skills a little bit more, a book like this might be appropriate. Now, I paid $29.99 for it Canadian when I got it. I looked it up. It is available on Amazon uh, and the price has gone up a little. On Amazon.ca, it's $32.99, and that's with Prime. I'm not sure what it would be without Prime, what the shipping might be. Um, yes, as far as books go, it is a bit pricey, but it's a very nice-looking book. Uh, and, you know, just for the inspiration alone. These are things you do not see on YouTube quite the same. Okay, There are people who do very nice uh, books on YouTube as well, but what I mean is... 
you don't get a sense of them. These are photographed professionally and it gives you a better idea of what the final product looks like. So that's why these type of books often appeal to me. Um, because you can sit there and you can look at the picture and study the way they constructed the book and it just gives me all kinds of other ideas. So again, that's Book and Art Handcrafting Artist Books by Dorothy Simpson Krost. And the link to this on Amazon is in the show notes. Okay, what does that take us to? Works in process. All right, so last week you got the last installment to the Clockwork Garden Journal featuring uh, Mike Deacon's partner, Ian's uh, Digi Prints. Um, that series is all done, and as I told you last week, I've put those pieces all together as one uh, video, and there was a link for that last week in the show notes, but you can just do a search for the Clockwork Journal, Clockwork Garden Journal, in my on my YouTube channel. What am I working on next? This is going to be another series over the period of the next six weeks, and this is what the final product looks like. Now, I think this turned out really nice. And you're going to say, well, what is this? A house on a block. Well, it is more than that because this is a drawer. And in this drawer, let me just take the drawer out, rotate it down, put it down, are little journals that I made as well. There are four of them in this set. They're on theme. General notes, I call one slide one out. General notes, uh, memories, travel, thoughts and ideas. And they are just blank pages inside with lines, but there's a little watermark of the house, the same as on the cover, on each page. And there are four of these, and these are stitched signatures, and they just fit right in the drawer of this. Now, that's not all. We can flip our lid. The top comes off this house. Put it down so you can see this. Top comes off. And inside is another album. Now this is called Moments. Could be a scrapbook album, a little mini one. It could be a art journal. I have blank pages in here. There's nothing on these. And I put them together with an elastic binding so that these little signatures will come out. And if you can, you could easily make another set to slip in there or whatever. Or if you're using it like for an art journal, you could slip these out so that you don't get the other pages mucked up with your mediums. And then when it's dry, put it back in. And it just drops right down inside the little house, just like that. And lid goes on the top. Cute, eh? I think it is. This is just so cute you could just die. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of fun making this. In fact, usually when I do these process videos, um, I'm only one week ahead of my actual video uh, of my vlog when I do it. This one, I did the whole thing in a matter of a couple of days and got it all filmed and ready to go. So for the next six weeks, you're going to get a part of this. And this week, you get part one. And what do I call this little thing? Bookhouse. How original, eh? So, here's the first part. So this is a new project I'm about to start. And I've had this paper mache house sitting in my stash of things for quite some time. I don't know why I bought it. I guess I thought it was cute and I could do something with it. But as I said, I've had it in my stash for a long, long time. Now it looks like, and I don't remember doing this, but I must have, it looks like I uh, did a one coat of gesso on this at one point. And this does open up on the top. And the other thing I found in my stash, besides the house, was this box. Now this box, I don't remember what came in this box, but it's kind of cute, and that's probably why I held on to it, because it's got this little drawer that slides right out and in. So I'm thinking to myself, what can I do with these two pieces? And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to mount this on top of this. I'll turn it so you can see it. So it'll look like this. And um, 
I'm going to decorate the house and the box below and I think I'll put some journals inside the drawer little small little signature sets maybe themed uh, you know one on travel like travel notes or recipes and things like that and in this one I'm going to make a little bigger journal that'll go inside the house and this could be a very small mini scrapbook of some sort and when it's all together I'm going to call it the book house an original title I know the book house so the first thing I've got to do well the first thing I would have done was done the gesso on the outside of this house I was thinking I should gesso this as well but I really like the finish of this box and the color so I may leave it just as it is but I may put some treatments something along the edges and on the front of this later I don't know so I'm going to set that aside for now and I'm going to concentrate my efforts on this house and I thought rather than paint this house just to give it something to cover it over I would take some old text pages old dictionary pages in an old book tear those up into little bits and glue them with matte medium all over the outside of this house and on the roof just as a start to give it a base coating and then from there I'll add more layers of other embellishments to build this house up so that's what I'm going to do right now so I'm going to take the top off first I'm going to concentrate on the house itself now I have these cutouts in here as well but I think I'll just fold pieces of the paper over top of them now I've got my gesso this is just gel or not gesso sorry this is gel matte medium and uh, I, I like to put um, buy them in huge bottles and put them in these little squirty bottles because uh, I find it's easier to work with and I've got a selection of brushes right here and um, I'm just going to glue them on and see what happens I mean it's just paper Ooh, that came out fast okay so let's just spread this around this could get messy and when I say could it will get messy and just carry on ripping up pieces and just sticking them down now as I said I'm not sure what to do about these windows but I think what I'll do is I'll just glue right over top of them and then I'll sort of press them through and uh, deal with them as I come to them and I don't want the, these to go in a straight line I am tearing them up but I want them oops maybe a little bigger piece than that Now I don't know if I should um, sort of mold the windows or press the paper through while this is wet or I should wait until it dries a little bit. I think I should let it dry a little bit and then I can sort of cut those out.
And I suppose I could apply some heat for my heat tool on this. This would dry it a little faster. I don't know if there's any advantage to that, but I could give it a go and see what happens. Now the reason I thought using book text on the outside of this would be appropriate is because I'm calling it the book house, so words. Okay, let's um, get out the heat dryer and just see how this works on this front part. Now I'm doing this because I want to see what's going to happen when I try to cut out these windows. And I'm debating in my mind right now as I dry this what I should use. I suppose an X-Acto knife would probably be the best way to go. But I think I need to have this really dry so that... Now I'm thinking that maybe I should just cut little X's into them in each square and fold the paper back onto the inside. Now I might, once I get all of this on the outside, I might take some white paint or gesso or something else and go all over the inside just to make it look a little neater. I don't know. We'll wait and see. Okay, this is going to take a little bit more time, so I'll come back when this is dry. Okay, so I've done three of the sides and I've pushed out the windows and I've learned a couple of little things along the way. One, leave a lot of overhang at the top so you can fold it in on the inside and with the windows dry them slightly and then just punch them through and apply your gesso inside and stick it all down it does get a little messy so if you're afraid of getting glue on your hands well I'm sorry but you're going to get glue on your hands so I'll show you what I mean so I'm going to do this side and I'm being fairly generous with the gel matte medium And you have to work fairly quickly, I'm finding, on this particular box, things seem to dry very fast. Now, I'm going to cover the windows right over with this piece, um, rather than have like gaps or pieces hanging out. Um, I found that this worked a little better. Now I see I've got a little piece hanging over here that doesn't have anything on it. But you want to know something? I, I'm out of dictionary paper and I have this, but it's a different color. And although I may do some colorizing of this later, right now I'm just not going to worry about that piece. It'll all blend in. So first thing I'm going to do is just see inside. You have this. It's very messy inside, but we're not worried about that. I just want to get that overhang piece secured. And then I'm going to take an X-Acto knife and just sort of punch these windows out. I'm just sticking my finger right in. And I'm just going to shape it. Now I'm going to take some more matte medium. I'm going to spread it on the inside in there. And I'm just using my paintbrush and sticking it through each window hole. And 
and then get in there with my fingers and sort of pull the pieces you can see I'm pulling the pieces to the edges and hoping they'll stick down it's a bit fiddly but you know I'm not really get out my words here I'm not really worried about how rough it looks on the inside because I said I'm going to paint this or something and it's only the inside nobody's going to really see that too often And even the outside of these windows looks a little rough. But, you know, that's the rustic nature of this. And I'm going to do some other things to these windows I have in the back of my mind later on. So those won't really show up as much, I'm hoping. Okay. So I'm going to take my heat gun to that. There's a chunk that doesn't want to stick down. So I find if I put a little heat on it and sort of use my fingers at the same time, it's like working with paper mache, basically. Well, it's glue, it's paper, it's paper mache. So I'm kind of molding my book pages in around these areas of the windows. And of course the windows aren't staying perfectly square, but that's okay. So I think that adds to the charm of this little piece. As this becomes tackier, it does start to stay, stick. Okay, it's not completely dry yet, but it's coming along. Now, what I think I'm going to do next, before I start working on the roof, is I'm going to cover the whole thing over with a thin layer of the gel matte medium, just to make sure everything's firmly stuck down. And I'll be back. So here's the little house, all covered in the dictionary pages and some book pages. I didn't have enough dictionary pages in my stash, which, go figure, I usually have lots of those. Um, probably still do, I just can't find them. So I decided just to use textbook pages, pages out of a book, for the roof. And uh, basically this went on just like paper mache. Um, I got, especially on the roof, because I had all these little nooks and crannies that I had to stuff these textbook pages into, I um, basically saturated the pages and laid them on and pressed them into the corners and the crannies. Um, when it was very wet with the glue. And that seemed to work okay. Now, of course, you can see here, I have two slightly different shades of color. This is sort of an off-white, and this is more black on white down here. And that doesn't really bother me. However, this is not finished. This, as I mentioned before, is just the base covering. Next thing I want to do is add a little distressing to this, a little color. And I'm thinking of using the distress inks by Tim Holtz, or actually the Distress Stains, if mine aren't all dried up, because I've had them for years, and sort of spray them on here and dab them with a paper towel kind of a thing. I don't want the text to disappear. I want it to appear through the staining, and that's why I'm going to use the stain, and see what it looks like from there. Right now, I'm thinking the color I'm going to use is probably frayed burlap, because it's kind of a lighter brown kind of shade, and we'll see from there. Uh, what we will do. So that's going to be next in our agenda. Oh, and just as a matter of point here, I also put an extra coat of gesso over top of everything once it had dried once. So there's two coats of gesso basically on here to make sure it sticks really well. Now this is still a little bit tacky, so I'm going to set it aside for about an hour just to finish drying up. I did use the heat gun, and I'm a little concerned about the lid. It did go in and it comes out kind of sticky, but I think I've got some stuff that I can put around here, a little cold wax, that'll allow it to slide in and out a little bit more uh, 
easily but I'll do that after everything is completely dry okay the roof and the base of my house are both thoroughly dry now and I've pulled out some Tim Holtz's distress spray stain I haven't used this bottle in a while so I shook it very well and it's called frayed burlap and I'm just going to mist it on this and then dab it with a paper towel to see if I can get a little color on this so we'll start with the roof Let's see if this is going to spray. Oh, it is. Now, the gel medium that I'm using, although it was a matte, is causing this to bead up a little bit. So I may need to dry between coats. To get it to stick and because this is a water soluble kind of ink if I put anything wet on top of this it will reactivate it so I'm going to have to spray this with a final fixative spray or workable fixative um, to avoid that problem now I'm just thinking here is this going to be dark enough it might be if I put on several coats so we'll just give it a dry And I'm not worried if it looks a little uneven because this is an old kind of uh, looking house. So that would be go with the distressed look. And I like the distressed look. Now this dries fairly quickly. So we'll see how it darkens with a second coat. And if that does darken it, we'll determine there whether or not we need to do a third coat. Okay, I think that's fairly dry, so we'll hit it with a second coat. And this stuff goes all over the place, so I have my work area protect it with uh, wax paper. And I think this time I'm just going to let that sort of soak in a bit. I'll give it a little bit of a dry and then I'll dab it with the paper towel. Okay. Yeah, I'm liking, liking that a little bit better. Again. If you're afraid of a mess this may not be for you because this is messy and you are going to get it on your hands now you could wear gloves but I don't bother So that's looking not too bad. Let's give it a bit of a dry. And I think this two coats might may be enough. So I'm going to let this dry and I'm going to go to the base of the house and I'm going to do the same thing with it. I'm going to give it two coats and I'll see how the two of them look together. Okay, so everything is dry. I put a final fixative on top of the distress inks here. So if I add anything wet to it, it's not going to reactivate and run. And now you can see my house is pretty much complete. Now, I want to add some door and window treatments to this and maybe a few other embellishments to the house. I'm thinking of putting sort of gingerbreading or whatever they call it along the gables up here and something as well. So. That'll be in the next part. Okay, so I hope you'll enjoy that series as we go from week to week. And I'm thinking after this one, I might do another variation of this kind of thing. I've got to look around Michael's and see what other paper mache little things I can find. Because I really like doing that.
Okay. Um, so I already talked about mom in the situation there. But one thing I didn't tell you is upon all this COVID business outbreak in her nursing home and the whole bit and the disappointment of her birthday, one thing good that has come out of this week is my mother's going to be moved into a private room. Now, she has been on the waiting list for a private room since she went into the home two years ago. They only have about nine private rooms. My mother's not a social creature. She used to be, not so much anymore. And she's in a semi-private at the moment uh, with a lovely lady. But of course, it wouldn't matter how lovely the resident is. My mother will find something to complain about. So a private room has come up. Actually, two private rooms came up. At the first of last week, I got a call saying there was a private room available if, you know, we were still interested in that kind of thing. But there was one drawback. It didn't have a washroom in that actual room. Now, my mother doesn't really use a washroom, okay? Just to be delicate about this. My mother's basically wearing a diaper and she's bedpanned all the time. Now, is this because she's incontinent or whatever? No. It's because my mother doesn't want to make the effort. And I'm not going to get into all of that, but basically my mother likes to be waited on hand, foot, and bum. So, you know, not having a washroom in her room isn't really a big problem. But I thought it was more of a problem for the staff. Um, I thought it would just make their life a little easier if there is a washroom in there. And the other part of it, this, a private room is more expensive than a semi-private. About $300 more a month. And I'm figuring if we're going to be paying $300 more a month, and this is the frugal part of me, then if we're paying the same price for a room with or without a washroom, then I want one with the washroom. Also, I was a little loath to have my mother move into a private room because even though she might complain a little bit about roommate, she needs to have socialization, okay? As it is now, my mother doesn't really take part in any of the activities that are in the nursing home. And um, she does talk to some of the other residents, you know, when the occasion comes up. It's not like she actually goes seeking out people for socialization. She basically sits in, in her wheelchair in front of a television set all day. So I'm thinking if she's in a private room, that's going to make her even more isolated. And, you know, that's not good for your health, as we all know during this time, right? Um, so I turned it down. Um, they have to go through me because I have power of attorney. And I did say to them, don't really bring it up to my mother because, you know, I didn't want to get her all excited. She hasn't been biting at the chomp for a private room or anything like that right now. But, you know, I don't want to get her excited and, pff, you know, pull the rug out from under. Her. Well, then three days later, they called me again. Another room had come available. Now, I told you, this place only has about nine private rooms. Uh, why did they become available? Think about it. They take the body out. They put a body in. Okay. So we try not to go that route. Um, this one does have a washroom in it. And apparently the lady who lives across the hall from the room, who's also in his, uh, uh private room, I guess, knows my mother, or at least my mother knows her. Now, I'm not sure how my mother knows her or whatever, but um, they seem to get along. So I thought, okay, potential for socialization. So I asked some other questions about the whole facility. And one thing I was concerned about is, okay, I can't go in there. They will move my mother into the room, but what about her connection for her phone and her TV? Uh, usually the, the uh, provider of those services comes into the nursing home, hooks it all up. And of course, right now, they're not letting people in, right? My mother has to have her TV. Well, they told me, no, they would look after that. They said most of that is done remotely. There's already a connection in the room for all of those things. So, you know, it's just flicking a switch or something and that'll be looked after. I said, okay, great. Now, I said, all right, well, as far as I'm concerned, it sounds good to me, but can you take my mother and show her the room? They said, oh, of course, we'll show her the room and everything. And they were giving my mother the weekend. This was Friday. They were giving my mother the weekend to make up her mind because I said, it is fine by me. If that's if my mother says she likes it and she wants to go there, then if she says yes, then you can do what you need to do to move her into the room. And uh, 
I'm ex suspecting that I will hear from them probably today about this um, because I did talk to my mother on the weekend about everything and and she said oh yes yeah, she saw the room and she really liked it and thought it was great and I said to her okay mom and I told her about the telephone the TV connection you know my, my concerns were there but I says we'll get it sorted out and everything and I said now mom of course you know we can't come into the home and you know help get your room arranged the way you might like it so you may have to put up with however they arrange it for you um, for a little while longer and then I said once we can get physically back into the nursing home we'll assess the room and you know we'll determine what other things you may need in the room you know pictures on the walls uh, maybe some additional furniture it's not a huge room but I think the lady that was in it before had a chest of drawers and she had a lazy boy in there which is more than the room my mother's in right now could handle so you know I'm thinking you know we can dress it up a little bit uh, for her since it's now a private room a kind of a deal but that's going to take some time until this thing is over with you know won't get in there so anyways I'm more concerned about the fact that her television sat in her t and her telephone are connected that is what I'll work on if I'm hoping this all goes smoothly ah, yeah my luck is never that good although they're really good there at the at the home she's in so that was something and uh, yeah I said to my mom I'd like to tell you I got this for you for your birthday but I don't have that kind of power <laughs> so there you go um what else okay I got something else new in the past week I got new tires on my car now did you know tires can rot talked a little bit about this on Stephen and Walter live yesterday yes apparently if you your car sits for long periods of time in that your tires will deteriorate and mine were because I don't drive my car very much my car is a 2008 Civic Honda Civic okay it's in great shape it's the best car I've ever owned but it also only has about 71,000 kilometers on it so that's 2008 so it's a 12 year old car okay um, I bought new tires for it about five years ago and have not put a lot of mileage on the car in five years. Uh, so those tires basically rotted. Walter was looking at them. Uh, one of my tires especially kept seeing, had a slow leak. Now there weren't any punctures in it that we could tell, but probably the seal around the rim was going and I think I'd had that fixed before. And once you do that to them, apparently, I am no mechanic. I know nothing about cars. Um, apparently, when you have that seal thing redone again, you are, you're just, it's a temporary thing. It, you, it'll probably start going again. So, anyways, Walter really thought that I should have new tires. So, off to Costco, I went and bought new tires. And I bought a type of all weather that they have a special name for them. They're supposed to also work to a certain degree not as effectively as snow tires but work like snow tires in the winter too but like i said i don't drive my car that much so now walter does have snow tires for his car because that's the car we drive all the time now what walter is saying is we should be driving my car out and about a little bit more you know just for the sake of the tires okay i'll be honest i don't like driving i'm a nervous driver i mean i'm not that nervous but I would much rather have somebody else do the driving, which in this case is Walter. And as I call it, driving Miss Daisy. Okay. Um, I keep telling people that I'm not going to get a new car until they finally got the technology where the car will drive itself and very reliably so. Then I'll buy one of those cars and it can drive me around. Actually, the reality is, as we grow older and now that we're both retired and the whole bit, that probably it'll get, eventually come down to one car. Um, and that'll be it, uh, with it. But right now we do have the two and mine has new tires. So there we go. Wow. Excitement. All right. Uh, what else? Oh, now this was excitement. I think I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago that I was having trouble with my Cricut maker, the fabric, uh, cutting feature on it with the rotary cutter 
wasn't cut in fabric. It was just gouging right into the mat. And I had tried everything, recalibrated it and everything. And I couldn't get to work, even bought a new blade for it. That didn't make any difference. So I sent a note off to Cricut and they had their note that, you know, it would take one to two weeks for the, someone to get back to me. And I figured, oh yeah, okay, fine. Um, but I wrote them a note, very lengthy, very detailed about my product and what I had tried. So I did get an answer from them. It took two weeks, um, but I got an answer from them. And it gave me step-by-step -step instructions as to what to try to fix the problem. Now, essentially, I had done these, what they had told me sometime before, a long time ago. I had a problem like this similar, and I pulled up my notes about that and followed those instructions and that didn't solve the problem this time. However, there was one little detail I didn't do that was different in these instructions they sent me this time. And essentially what it was was to unplug the machine. Even though the machine is turned off when you're doing some of these other things to start with, they said turn on your machine, unplug it, hold down the power button and the mat feeder button down at the same time, hold them down. As you're holding them down, plug the machine back in, and when the power button turns red, then you there's some other steps you have to do. So I followed those. Guess what? Works like a charm. Simple as that. Who would have known? Now, I'll say one thing about Cricut, because before I have cut up other companies about their customer service. Cricut's customer service is very good. Yes, it took two weeks for them to get back to me. However, I have dealt with their customer service before and most of the times through live chat. They don't have live chat available right now because of COVID. Um, and so I guess they have to do everything via email and I guess that's why it's taking a little longer. Um, you know, I don't know what their personnel situation is or how they handle all of this, but they did get back to me and it did work and they seem to have a solution. So that's one thing I like about the Cricut company. They do take their uh, customer service seriously. Um, and just as an aside, this just came across my desk this morning before I started my vlog about the Cricut. Um, a friend of mine on another site, uh, a quilting site, sent me a note and said, you may know this already or heard of it, but he had saw on, on Facebook or somewhere uh, several people talking about the fact that uh, the Cricut machines, if you leave them plugged in, can burst into flames. They can burn. First I've heard of that. So I went and investigated some of this. And yes, there were some people who claimed that they had a fire in their house because they'd left their Cricut plugged in. But these were, these some of these extend back, there weren't a lot of them. But there were lots of people bitching about this and the other thing. And it looked to me more or less like if this was true, it didn't have so much to do with the Cricut machine as it had to do with the way the Cricut machine was plugged in. In other words, it was plugged into a giant power bar octopus. And those things, it was overloaded. Maybe. Might have also been some people trying to get something for nothing. Some of these claims were like from 2010. So 10 years ago. First, I've heard of it, and the company basically were saying, no, that shouldn't happen. I mean, let's face it, any appliance, uh, you leave your fridge plugged in, you leave your stove plugged in, you leave your coffee makers plugged in, your toasters plugged in, your toaster ovens plugged in, your microwaves plugged in, your lights in your house plugged in, everything's plugged in, okay? So, yeah. All those things have the potential, if they're faulty, for one reason or another, to start a fire. But there are safeguards built into most modern appliances and into the Cricut as well. Uh, but if you overload a power bar, and if you buy a cheap power bar from a dollar store, well, you're asking for trouble with those. Um, yeah, you potentially could have a fire. But I think this was scaremongering for other reasons. I don't know for sure. First I'd ever heard of it. And these reports seem to be somewhat old, too. It wasn't like this just was just happening yesterday. So anyways, I appreciate him letting me know about this. Um, and I just did my due diligence and investigated it. Now, my machine is plugged in, but it's not turned on. But, you know, just keep an eye on it. But I've never had a problem like that with 
anything, really. Okay, so I just happened, I just thought I'd mention that because it had just come across my desk this morning. And we're talking about the Cricut machine. Okay, so what else in the past week? Walter was making his now famous <laughs> bolognese. Uh, and the noodles that I can't pronounce, I don't know why I have a hard name with this pasta. Pa Pepperella? Pepperi? I don't know. But anyways, I made a little video of his little cooking experience. And this is one of my favorite dishes now. So let's check on what Walter's cooking today. He's mushing his meat. Why are you mushing meat? It's supposed to be really fine. Oh, and what is it that we're making? Bolognese. Bolognese, mmm, bolognese. He made it once before, it's quite good. It's just not meat sauce, you know. There are things in it. Plus he's making homemade pasta again and it's gonna take a little while and yeah, it's fine and what is the pasta called that you're making paparadella paparadella which are big wide noodles which we've looked in the grocery store and you don't can't seem to buy them no nope. but, but this will be fresh pasta made from scratch well walter is dutch not italian but he makes good pasta and actually this is becoming one of my favorite dishes and tonight is Wednesday, and we call Wednesday nights Avante Wednesdays, because there's a restaurant we used to go to back in the days before the disease, and we usually go on, like on a Wednesday night, and uh, they always had a good food, but now we do it at home. And when I say we, I mean Walter, because I don't do this. I could. But why? Somebody else will do it for you. Why bother? And of course, he has his wine of glass. A oh, oh, wine of glass. Ooh, I've only had one glass. He has his wa glass wine. <laughs> wine glass. That's the term I want. Gee. Filled oh, yeah. with a actually a real wine for a change. And when I say that, it's because we're used to drinking stuff out of boxes a lot. And. Uh, this was wine that was given to us by friends as sort of as a as a gift for making them a quilt. And uh, it's one of our favorite Canadian wineries, which is called uh, Foreign Affair. And this is their, I'm not sure what the name of it is. It's got Bianco at the end of it. So it's a white. Oh, it's Conspiracy Bianco. No, Bianco, no. it's white. Yeah, I don't. It's conspiracy or blanco, blanco, blonde or something. I don't know. Whatever it is, but it's pretty good wine. And uh, yeah, I know we're having like meat sauce, so you should have red wine, but we have that well, too. There's white wine in the meat sauce, so. Oh, there is? I hope you put the cheap crap in and not the good stuff. Yeah, I did. Okay. Anyways, this looks good. Okay, so now Walter's making his fresh homemade pasta. He's playing with his dough. He's putting it in his pasta maker and he's flattening it. And how many times do you do this? I don't know, until I decide it's, it looks okay. Oh, okay, so that's how you do it, I guess. I don't know, never made fresh pasta. I probably could if I had to, but why It's like the old ringer washers. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wanna do my undies while you're at it? Ring them out? Mmm, <laughs> fresh pasta. There is a difference when you have, you wouldn't think, but it does. Fresh pasta tastes a lot better than your dried pasta that you boil. I don't know why it is, but it does. And this is the, how do you say that? Paparel, pap Paparadel. All it is is noodles that are cut though three and a half inches wide. Right. Well, we'll see that in a bit. Okay, so now Walter is cutting his noodles and he made a little mistake. He said, how big did you say? I said three and a half inch. They're supposed to be about three quarter of an inch. Three and a half inch would make them really big noodles. And this is how he does it after he's pressed all his dough out through the pasta maker. Now he's cutting, rolls it, cuts them into little thingies and then unrolls them and you have the word I cannot say. 
Papper Adele. Papper Adele. Papper Adele. Well, I don't know. I'm not Italian, so who knows? Maybe oh, just it's a Cana- Canadian Papper Adele. Papper Adele. It's a Papper Adele. You like a Papper Adele with the willow? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. Looks good. Oh, and I see you put down wax paper on the counter for change. Oh. Why? You didn't want to make glue that we have to chip uh, off the uh, counter afterwards? Yeah. So here he's got a little pasta. He's putting back in there and he's flattening it out. And then he does what he needs to do to make those noodles. Mm, and here's the final product. Doesn't it look delicious? Are you enjoying it, Walter? Mm. Is it good? Yes, it is. I haven't tried mine yet. Of course you'd say it's good because you made it. It looks delicious. And that was really delicious. I love it. I think next to lasagna, that's my favorite pasta dish. Okay, what's coming up? Not a heck of a lot. I have a uh, a guild executive meeting. Of course, it's virtual. Uh, This coming Wednesday, and I'm the secretary, so yeah. So I've got to get that prepped and ready to go with that. And we have uh, a new executive, uh, like half of our executive became new this year. Uh, So we have a new president. And so we, you know, have our first meeting with the new executive. And, ooh, exciting news. I'm getting a haircut. Now, of course, now that we're, we can do that kind of thing, it's not so you know, exciting. And of course, I don't go very long without a haircut. Now you're going to say, you need a haircut? I get my haircut every three weeks. Okay. So it looks like I don't need a haircut at any given time. Um, I'm just like that. You know, you may think that's obsessive and it probably is, but nope, I have to get my haircut. And when I'm in there, she also trims my beard a little bit. I trim it myself too, but it's nice to have a professional do it as well. Um, yeah, and that's about all that's coming up. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, well, when you get excited over the fact that you got new tires for your car, you have a, an executive meeting online, and you're getting a haircut, wow, there's a full life, isn't it? <laughs> so I hope your life's a little bit more fuller than mine right now. I hope you're healthy. Uh, I hope you aren't out there hugging people when you shouldn't be. And so stay healthy and have a good week. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now.